Well, let me begin by reminding us that electricity is tantamount to modernity. Almost everything we associate with the 21st century world is predicated on the availability of electricity. And when you look at this image behind me, where you see light, you see the modern world. Where you don't see light, there's one of two conditions. Either nobody lives there, or the place hasn't been electrified. And if it hasn't been electrified, there's no more precious gift that we can give those people than sustainable electricity. And sustainable electricity is not going to involve building gigantic coal plants. It's going to involve photovoltaics, wind. It's locally sited. Storage is the key enabler here. Why? Because wind and solar are intermittent. And because they're intermittent, they can't be fully integrated into base load, which means then you'd have to have some other source to back up. With, with batteries, you could draw electricity from the sun even when the sun doesn't shine. And that's a powerful idea. And, you know, let's be honest, renewables minus storage is not a solution. It actually adds to the problem. But it's not just for renewables. Even in the conventional grid, storage would make much more efficient use of the assets that we have, because we're designing our grid today so that it can meet peak demand. And peak demand is 40 to 50 percent above average demand, and we only reach that 1 or 2 percent of the time. So we have all this idle capacity sitting there. With storage, we could level out the demand. The other thing is that the grid is so different from everything else, every other commodity that we deal with. You know, the, the electricity powering the lights in this theater was generated just moments ago. Because the way the grid operates, supply must be in balance with demand everywhere at all times. So what you're looking at behind me is the world's largest supply chain with zero inventory. It's just crazy. But with a battery, we would have the ability to do what refrigeration did to our food supply or what storage tanks did to our water supply. Batteries would level out things for us in a way that we haven't known up until now. Oh, by the way, you know this image. It's a collage. It's a collage of various images. It's not a NASA image of the world at night. You know, when it's dark in the United States, it's light in China. The world never looks like this. If it ever does, it's a really bad day for all of us. <laughs> but I tell some audiences this, and they're puzzled. They said, no, 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 that's a NASA image of the world by night. And somebody missed the day of high school, I guess. <laughs> so the need for batteries is so compelling, why don't we have them? It comes down to cost. I had one of my students make this chart for me. It was done about uh, 2010 when lithium-ion batteries are about $1,000 a kilowatt hour. And this is a semi-logarithmic plot. So every time you go up one click on the y-axis, you go up by a factor of 10. And what you see here is that pumped hydro is really the, the only thing that's used in abundance. Because if you really count carefully, all of those batteries are less than 0.1%, so they don't amount to anything. The other thing that I learned from looking at this chart was that if I go to invent a battery and it is not priced below $500 a kilowatt hour, I'm wasting my time. So that made me start thinking about cost at the very earliest stages of discovery. And the last thing I'll say by way of uh, introduction Let's not forget the origin of the battery. The battery was invented by a professor, Alessandro Volta, at a university. A professor invented the battery at the university. You can see the image in the center of the 10,000 lira note. It's a stack of coins, silver and zinc, separated by cardboard soaked in brine. And with this invention, Volta gave us a new field of science, electrochemistry, but relevant to Hello Tomorrow, within 10 years of his discovery, this battery was powering new technologies, electroplating, electroforming. The other thing that Volta's discovery did 
For the first time, it demonstrated the utility of a professor. Until Volta's discovery, nobody imagined a professor could be of any use. But Volta showed that if you give a professor resources, students, leave him alone, he's liable to do something of value to society. We should keep that in mind today. So what's my approach? I've got to invent something that's cheap. So first thing, confine the chemistry to earth abundant elements. Now, here's another chart. It's also semi-logarithmic, and it basically shows the relative abundance of each of the elements. And you see that there's a group in the upper left that are very abundant, and there's a group in the lower right that are relatively scarce. And the difference in abundance is one billion, one billion times. So one of the things that I told my students when we began the center prize is that they're forbidden to go into the lower right part of the periodic table because it doesn't matter what the battery does, the material is so scarce it won't scale. I mean, look at tellurium is about as abundant as gold. I don't know why you would work on cadmium telluride solar cells. Even if you got them for free, there isn't enough tellurium in the Earth's crust to make any difference. So you better work in the upper, upper left corner. I say if you want to make something dirt cheap, you should make it out of dirt, and preferably dirt that's locally sourced. It doesn't make sense to trade your dependence on imported petroleum for dependence on imported neodymium. Your money is still leaving the country. And the other thing, make it easy to manufacture. This is where lithium ion fails. It's very elaborate and very costly. The reason you have a gigafactory is because it costs five giga dollars. So you got to think about the design on day one. So when I started thinking about this battery, I said, I, I need to ask the right question. And a couple of things I did along the way. First of all, I disregarded conventional wisdom. I did not consult any battery experts. Battery experts would have told me everything I was thinking about was crazy, it wouldn't work. And I looked outside the field of batteries for inspiration. My other area of research is electrometallurgy. And I'd done a lot of work on aluminum smelting. And I looked at a modern aluminum smelter where you have bauxite, petroleum coke, takes 14 kilowatt hours of electricity that's being consumed to make a kilogram of metal product. And the plant costs $5,000 a ton, so a 200,000 ton a year plant costs you a billion dollars. And yet we can turn dirt into metal for less than $1 per kilogram. I said, that's an economic miracle of modern metallurgy. Can I learn something from that and use it to build a battery? This is what a modern smelter looks like. That's about 25 meters across and probably recedes about one and a half kilometers. And right there you can see the form of a man. You see that? That gives you a sense of scale. And this thing consumes huge quantities of electricity to make aluminum. And I said, if I could take this thing and teach it how to hold electricity and give it back on demand, I know at the end of the day, I'm going to have something that's big and cheap. So that was my approach. Don't start with a battery that powers this and try to figure out how to make it big. I started with something that was a giant energy consumer and said, how do I teach it to be an energy store? This was invented in 1886 by two men working independently. Charles Martin Hall in the United States and Paul E. Rule here in France. There they are, that's who Rule on the left and Hall on the right. They were both born in the same year and they both died in the same year. They met once in 1911 at a conference in uh, Philadelphia. Well, if they were both born in the same year in 1886, I guess they must have been the same age. So how old were these two young lads in 1886? 52, 42, 32, 22. Two 22 year olds changed the world. By inventing this process, they turned aluminum from a precious metal costing more than silver into a common structural material. But let's not forget, aluminum is the third most abundant element in the Earth's crust. If they'd made this process for rhodium, it wouldn't have made any difference. So this is a liquid metal battery which I invented based on the aluminum smelter. The bottom two layers, the salt and the dense metal, look very much like an aluminum cell. 
but there's no gas at the top. Instead, I put a second light metal at the top. And this battery discharges by alloying the top metal into the bottom metal, liberates electrons, and then to charge the battery, we force current through and bring the battery back to its pristine state. As the current flows, it generates heat. We trap that heat, and that keeps the battery at temperature. That's, I've simplified it a little bit, but that's, that's basically it. And this is my team, a group of students, young people. And apart from the, that fellow down in the lower left, none of them had experience in electrochemistry, and none of them had experience with batteries. I purposely chose people that were bright, young, inspired, but not inured with battery chemistry. And they worked miracles. Initially, it was terrible, but after about two years, they were doing things that no one imagined. All right, so what's the status? Been at this for about seven years. We've tested over a thousand cells, different chemistries, different combinations of metals and alloys, different combinations of salts, and a number of them coming in at less than $100 a kilowatt hour. And by the way, it's not just cook and look. I have tenure. Tenure means never having to say you're sorry. So I don't care. I don't have to publish. But I do publish in order to launch the careers of young people. And occasionally we get a paper in Nature, which is arguably the premier scientific journal on the planet. Now, my students, not I, my students, two of my students dragged me kicking and screaming, saying, we're going to start a company. So we started this company in 2010. All the catchy names were already taken, so we had to come up with a name. It was the Liquid Metal Battery Corporation. I can't think of a more boring name. And then a couple of years later, we renamed it Ambry because we invented the battery in Cambridge, and Ambry is in the heart of Cambridge. Now, my Series A funding came from Bill Gates. Now, I was born in Canada. I'm very polite. I wouldn't dare go to Bill Gates. How did I meet Bill Gates? He came to me because he was watching my chemistry lectures online. I was teaching a big freshman chemistry class at MIT, and the lectures were recorded and posted on the internet. And he started watching. We watched all 35 of them, and eventually came to meet with me. And we talked about distance learning and computers and whatever. And he says, so what are you working on in the lab? And I told him, he says, if you ever decide to spin that out, let me know, I'd put some money into it. So I met Bill Gates, not because I wrote an op-ed piece for the Wall Street Journal. I met Bill Gates because I was teaching freshman chemistry. It's a strange story. And then the French energy company, Total, matched Bill Gates, and that's how we got started. So this is the kind of stuff we're doing these days. These cells are 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter square. Each cell is 80 amp hours, and then we'll gang four of those together, and we'll end up with 380 amp hours. And just for reference, this is what the uh, 18650 looks like that's built in the Gigafactory. And why is that important? Because if you want to put one megawatt hour on 50 square meters footprint, you're going to need almost 100,000 of those lithium ion cells, whereas we need about 2,500. But this is the thing that makes the liquid metal battery really different. This is a cell. This is showing you the discharge capacity as a function of cycle number. And we're going 93% depth of discharge. So it's full charge to almost full discharge, really high stress test. That's the fade rate. It's just a number. What it means is if you were to discharge this battery once a day, every day for 10 years, you'd retain over 99% capacity. That's good. This is data from Panasonic. This is from their website. I didn't make this stuff up. And if I take their data and put it on here, this is what a lithium-ion battery looks like under the same operating conditions. After 500 cycles, they've lost one-third of their capacity. After 1,000 cycles, they've lost two-thirds of their capacity. So that's important. So the only question, though, is what's my battery cost? So our cost models indicate we're probably going to be down around $300 a kilowatt hour. But it's not good enough, because here's some data from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. The vertical axis is the price of lithium ion. The horizontal axis is time. And you can see it starts at $1,000 a kilowatt hour. And it's come down, down, down. And as it gets lower and lower, my investors keep saying, you're toast. 
You better do something about this. So we started with lithium lead antimony at about 270. Lithium ion dropped, so we changed chemistry. We moved to lithium bismuth. We got down to 170. Lithium ion has dropped again. So I said, well, I'm going to keep inventing. So I'm here to announce a, a new chemistry. We call it Chem-C. It's discovered at MIT. Radical innovations in both the chemical composition and the construction of the cell. And it's well below $100 a kilowatt hour today. So there's where we are. And you see that dotted line? That dotted line is a projection. But people believe that stuff. They fit this into a semi-log plot, got the slope, and said 19% rate of learning, and said by 2030 it's going to be less than the cost of the components. That's what I have to come up against. By the way, we don't know what our learning rate is going to be. I think we could be down below $50 a kilowatt hour. Anyways, this is the last piece of data I'll show you. This is a cell that's been running for four years at temperature. Four years at temperature, 4,000 cycles. That's three times a day. Well, 3,650 cycles is 10 years. So you have a simulation of 10 years, four years at temperature. Look at the thing. This is the storage capacity. It is absolutely flat greater than 99% in ink plate capacity. So I think this is probably a good time to bring the talk to a close. And since I'm in Paris, almost 50 years ago, this was the slogan. Be realistic. Ask for the impossible. That's what I tell my students. And you know, sometimes, with enough ingenuity, the impossible becomes the inevitable. Thank you.